you, Jesus. God is good. We serve a good God. You know, I was, uh, this last week, uh, I, act, I think I found paradise. And if you want to know where paradise is, let me know, and I think I'll give you the directions. I, I don't know if I want to let too many people know about paradise, because, uh, you know, it was nice to be in a place where there was not a whole lot of people, and basically you have it all to yourself. Amen? Um, I was up in a place called San Simeon, and, and it's right next to a little town called Cambria. San Simeon has a population of less than 500 people. That's how small it is. And uh, the, the beauty about San Simeon and Cambria is they're along the central coast. So they're not like beaches that we normally are used to, like when we go down to Huntington or you go down to uh, um, Bolsa Chica and all these beaches in Orange County or maybe down towards San Diego, you know, can't find parking, there's lots of people, you know, the list goes on. These beaches are totally different, totally different. They basically have lots of parking, right? There's not that many people, and the list goes on. It's so awesome. So anyways, I got to spend a week down there, and uh, oh, it was great. And uh, so I'm rejuvenated, I'm rested, and... Uh, how many people know that we need to take time sometimes to just kind of, you know, recharge the batteries? You know, I don't know about you and how your life is, but I work a regular job. And the last couple of weeks, you know, I'm putting in 60, 70 hours of, of work a week, right? On top of that, running a church, you know, just because the sign says our services are only on Sundays and Wednesdays and men's breakfast on Saturdays, women's on Saturday, the following Saturday, and those types of things, and you think, well, the calendar says that the church ain't open on, on Monday or Tuesday or, or Friday. Incorrect. Just because the calendar says we're not having an event, that don't mean that Pastor Trish and I don't get called on. We get phone calls all the time, people needing assistance in some way shape or form right people calling to ask can you come to the hospital and pray for my family member you know uh, can you help us with this can you help us with that so there's a lot of need out there amen and what I'm believing for is helpers that I can say oh you need some help and I just get on the phone and I'll say oh I got a job right here for brother so-and-so sister so-and-so the pastor doesn't have to do everything amen how many of you who have jobs in the regular workplace, does your boss do all the work? No. Oh, he doesn't. What is he doing? Oh, he's sitting back in the office with his feet on the desk? Or he's taking those long lunches, right? Right? You get what I'm saying? This ministry is a team effort, not an individual effort. Amen? All right. God is good. And he's doing things all the time. Amen? Amen? And so this morning, we're going to talk about something that's very key in our lives. And that is something called transformation. And I want to show you something from the scriptures. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 26. And I want to show you something that hopefully can help every one of us this morning. As you're turning to Acts 26, I'm going to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord. Oh, you're worthy to be praised. Lord, I thank you that you speak to your people through your word. I pray, Father, that there's revelations this morning. And thank you, Lord, that your word does not return void, but accomplishes the thing whereunto you sent it. Oh, Lord, we give you glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone says amen and amen. So here we are. We're going to be in the Acts chapter 26. And what's happening, let me give you a little background. The Apostle Paul is going to be basically sharing his conversion with somebody. We learned that the Apostle Paul has gone through a lot of things and, and basically he's going to share his conversion, in other words, change in his life with, I believe it's King Agrippa. And what's interesting is that Paul shares with us some things that he shares earlier on in the early chapters of the book of Acts. So he's sharing about his conversion, right? What is a conversion? 
A conversion defined is a physical transformation, right? Conversion. There are many things that can be converted. You can convert miles to kilometers. You can convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, meters to feet, dollars to euros or pesos, whatever it is, right? It's a change. But what was changed in Paul's life was his character, right? His character is what was changed. Now, how did that happen? Let's go to Acts chapter 6, and we're going to start here in verse 12. Acts chapter, I'm sorry, 26, 26, Acts chapter 26. And here we see the Apostle Paul, he's giving a recount of what happened. How did this take place? And he says, while thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. You've got to remember, Paul was a, was a leader in the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, um, in Judaism. You know, the, 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 the Jewish way of doing things, the Jewish religion. He was an elder, you know, in that camp, right? And here in verse 13 it says, at midday, O king, Along the road I saw light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. Verse 14. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Remember, Paul's name was Saul. But why do we call him now Paul? He had a character change. You see, we see oftentimes in the Bible, when somebody's character was changed, they started being called something else. Right? See, so Saul was his birth name. But then he became Paul, as we know in the New Testament. Right? There was a change. But look at something here. It says at midday, in verse 13, O king, along the road I saw light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. See, there was a light, right? And what does light do? It illuminates, amen? Light illuminates, right? And it was brighter than the sun, it says, right? Verse 13, yeah, brighter than the sun is what we see in verse 13. So what did that light do to Paul that changed his life? What that light did was it showed him something. It showed him something. If you ever want to see a flaw in a piece of fabric, hold it up to the light. And what will you see? You'll see the fibers inside that fabric, right? You'll start to see if there's any kind of tears in those fibers. Why? Because the light reveals that because it's directly under the light. Anybody, anybody ever get a, a letter from the school before mom and dad got home and it had your name on it to the parents of so-and-so? And what did you do with that letter? You went and put it underneath the light to what? To read it. Some of you who are more advanced, I know you went and got a pot of water, put it over the stove and steamed it and let the, to open it actually up. Now, you guys were the brave ones. You guys were the brave ones. Some of us weren't so brave to do that kind of stuff. Some of us, you know, we, we were a little sneaky, but we kind of, we drew the line somewhere, amen? We knew our limits. But then you had those ones who are really sneaky, right? And they put the letter over the steam so they can open it up and read it, right? But for those of us who put the letter up to the light, what did we see? We got to actually see something in there, right? It exposed some of the contents of the letter, right? Because that's what the light does. Now what's interesting is, is this encounter with Paul, the, when he had this encounter with Jesus, the light revealed something about Paul on the inside, the inner man. You see where I'm going here? It exposed the inner man is what happened. Now, one thing that happened in this encounter with Paul right here, look at what he says here in verse, let me see here. Verse 15, he says, So I said, 
Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now get this. Here Saul is, before he becomes Paul, here he is. And what his whole goal in life was at the time was, he was given authority by the other leaders and elders in the Jewish sect, Judaism, the leaders of the Jewish church. He was given authority to go and do one thing. And that was to go persecute Christians. To go and harass them because they didn't agree with what the Christians were doing. Because why? What were the Christians doing? They were putting their trust and their life and their hope and their faith in a, in a man called Jesus Christ. Right? And to them, they didn't agree with that. So they ended up putting him on a cross and killing him. So now here we are later, after Jesus has gone to the cross, right? Jesus has already gone to the cross, been crucified. And now Paul has an encounter with this experience and the light says, he says, who are you? And he says, Jesus. Paul finds out that Jesus is alive. Isn't that awesome? What would that do to you? It would really do something. You mean those people who are following after Jesus, they got it right because he is alive? That's what happened with Paul. He found out that Jesus was alive. And then what happened, we see in verse 13, what did the light do? Well, see, what the light did basically was it exposed him on the inside. Just like if you were to take that fabric and hold it underneath the light to expose the fibers that are, you know, not right, whatever. Same thing if you held an, a closed envelope that's not addressed to you, so you want to be nosy and read it, you hold it to the light. Or, you, or when those checks come and other people's names, oh, how, how much is it? Because they owe me money. They owe me some money. <laughs> right? You see how the light exposes those things. Same thing with Paul. It was an internal thing. The light exposed him on the inside. And he had to deal with some things. Right? Now it tells us here in verse number 14, it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean? Well, if you want to hear that in... Layman's terms are simple English, as we call it, right? It's basically what the Lord Jesus is saying is, is that G Paul was struggling against his conscience and the call of God on his life. See, to kick against the goads was basically, uh, was Jesus was referring to something that would be done to the livestock, to the oxes and the other animals. Anybody ever hear of a cattle prod? Right? Anybody ever heard of a cattle prod? Well, if you don't know what a cattle prod is, it's a, a device, it's like a stick that they use to move big animals. So say you're a farmer, right, and you got this big, uh, uh, you know, animal, like an ox, and you want him to go from point A to point B, do you just whistle at him or click your fingers like you do Fido and say, come on, boy, come on, let's go. Right? And when your dog doesn't want to go, what do you do? You just go and you pick him up. Come here. Right? Well, when you're talking about a probably a few thousand pound animal, that ain't going to happen. So he needs a little bit of encouragement. So what do the farmers do? They poke him with like a stick. They poke him. Right? Here it's called a goad, but same concept. They call a, a cattle prod. Right? So what Jesus is basically saying, he's using an analogy, right? For Paul, telling him, why are you fighting this, right? Why are you struggling in your conscience and the call of God on your life, right? That's what Jesus was telling him. Why are you kicking against the goads? In other words, why are you fighting against what's really should be going on? See, the thing is this. Paul was struggling with emptiness. He was struggling with weakness and Judaism and his own inability to meet the demands of the law. See, this is what you need to understand about Judaism, right? Judaism has all these laws and regulations. And in the law, nobody could live up to those expectations. Nobody. But yet, you're expected to at least try. 
So here you are living a life trying to live up to an expectation that you can never live up to. What does that do to you? What if you can never meet that demand? It's going to do something to you. And this is what was happening to Paul. He couldn't live up to these expectations that were placed on him. Right? And so what happens is, yeah, he had some emptiness. He started to doubt his ability because of his inability. Right? Because of these demands that were placed on him. He knew that he came up short. Right? Because nobody could live up to the law. See, there's a lot of similarities in this world that we live in today. Right? A lot of similarities. This world is never fulfilling. Although there are times of contentment. Right? Income tax checks come. <gasps> oh! For about a week, right? Party time. Right? Party time. Oh, we're going to Disneyland. Oh, let's go get some shoes. Uh, oh, we're going out to eat tonight. Right? The list goes on. Right? But then when it's gone all of a sudden, why is it that we go from, I can't wait to get up tomorrow. I got money to spend. To waking up the next day like, it's all gone. <laughs> How come I didn't, I, oh, why didn't I go and get the car fixed? The car needed new tires. Right? Or why didn't I pay that bill off? And then you start thinking, next year I'll do that. Right? But you think, well, I did have fun. Right? But see how it's temporary? You see how it doesn't last forever? See, if money was the answer to all your problems, why is it that those people who have lots of it, unlimited amount of it, millions, why is it that they still got problems? Why are they still finding themselves in situations of depression, right? Suicide, right? The list goes on. Why, why are they abusing substances, whatever it may be? Because they're not fulfilled. Things on this earth will not bring you fulfillment. They'll bring you temporary pleasure. We know this. Temporary pleasure, right? But once that is over with, the pleasure's over with, it's gone. See, the thing we need to learn is that a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ brings a fulfillment. And it's a fulfillment that will not go away because it's not a feeling, it's something on the inside. No matter what's going on in life, even when things aren't going good, you have still a sense of everything's okay. See, that's what a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ does. It, it gets better. Thank you for that amen. See, the Apostle Paul here is talking now to the king, sharing his testimony about what transpired. See, he's sharing with us, right, what transpired in his encounter with the Lord Jesus, right? And, and the thing is this, is that he found something that forever changed him. It changed him so much that he's no longer called Saul, but he's called Paul. It changed him so much that he was sent on a, on a mission by the Lord Jesus to tell others about him. He ended up writing most of the New Testament. All these epistles in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote. That's how changed he was from this encounter from the inside. You know, what's, what's interesting about you know, this transformation that we're looking at, what happened with Paul that, that takes place. You know, it, it's something that happens on the inside. Amen? And see, something that we need to learn about changing, right? Let me, let me share something with you about changing, about transformation. See, transformation does not come by behavioral changes or modifications but it's by inner transformation. You can change your external, outward behavior without inner change. You can change things about yourself on the outside, but if it doesn't take place on the inside, it's all temporary, not going to last. Right? The outward behavior will not last. See, we got to change on the inside. That is the exact reason why when, you know, People come to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, 
right? They accept him as their Lord and Savior. They're all excited. They're like, hey, I went to church and, you know, I invited Jesus into my heart and, and I believe now and, you know, you're, they're excited. But then you'd go and talk to them a few months later and it's like, they're not even at church. Where are you? What happened? Where's your zeal? Where's your fire for God? It was, you know, an encounter. And there's a, a process that takes place in the Christian's life, and it's more than receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There has to be a transformation here. You have to change the way you think. There has to be a change, right? We talked about earlier what the word conversion means, a physical transformation. It actually has to be changed. Let's hold your place here and let's go to the book of Romans chapter 12. Many of you should know this scripture. I've shared it many times. haven't shared it in a while, but Romans chapter 12. Look at what Paul tells us here about this. Romans 12 verse 2. And he says, do not be conformed to this world. What does the being conformed to this world mean? The norm. The norm. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, there's a transformation that must take place and it's right here. And until this changes, things will always remain the same. I've met so many people that love Jesus. They tell me how they believe in God, they love Him with all their heart, but there are just some things they can't stop doing. Right? People who have addictions, whatever they are. There's, there's so many types of addiction today, I mean, we can't even just narrow it down to a few. Right? Right? There's addictions. Things you just can't stop doing. It's just too hard. Right? You need to do them. And the thing is this, is that People that are experiencing addictions is that they get to a place where they get frustrated because they say, I can't stop. I can't. It's bigger than me. It's taken a hold of me. It owns me. Right? It, I've become a slave to it. Right? And my whole life revolves around that addiction now. Right? And the only way to overcome that, right, is right here. There's got to be a change in the way you think. See, if you get to a place where you get to so, uh, uh, you're defeated, oh, I can't do it, then you never will. Right? You never will. See, behavior modification has nothing to do with what happens on the inside. It has to start on the inside, and that's what happened with Paul. See, when Jesus exposed him with the light, he had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus revealed who he was, showed him, showed him who he was on the inside. Not on the outside, but on the inside. And when Paul understood that and, be, and came to terms with those things, he was forever changed because transformation took place, and that's where it starts. Amen? We've got to start allowing God to change us. Some of us still have a lot of our old way of thinking. You know, we've been in church for a lot of years and we still think the same way. Why? Because we haven't changed on that certain thing. Money, for instance. It's always a nice topic to talk about, right? Some people believe they can't afford to put anything inside this thing. You're like, oh, I knew it. There he goes again, talking about money. Right? This thing right here. You know, I, I, I get a kick out of other churches. Everybody does things differently. And I tell you one thing about this church. We're not going to beat you over the head because you didn't put anything in it. We're not going to beat you in the head, you know, because of, you know, how little you put in it. And we're not going to do ten offerings, you know, to try to take every dollar out of your wallet before you leave this place. Right? Our goal here is to help people grow. Right? We want to help people grow. So we do a tithe and offering. Right? Tithing is a form of worship. So what we do is we want to help people. You know, we want to help people learn about ways to you know, better their financial situation. 
And some people don't understand that by giving to God, you can help your financial situation. And, and the thing is this, is like, you're like, well, I can't afford to give. Love it. That's okay. You could still benefit financially. Even if you didn't, can't afford to give. Because we tell you to what? For those who come to this church regularly know that we say, put a nickel in here. How many churches do you go to and they tell you, put a nickel in if that's all you got? No, they want to see some paper. <laughs> they want to see some paper. We tell you, put a nickel in. And if you don't have a nickel, ask Brother Anthony. He'll give you one. I hear a lot of change jingling in his pocket. Is that for the gumball machine? <laughs> and the whole concept of why do we want you to give, give something, even if it's a nickel? Because it's a faith project is what it is. It's a way to exercise your faith. See, you know, faith is about believing God to do something that you can't see. That's what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, right? <laughs> Let me see this. The substance of things hoped for, right? The evidence of things not seen. And, and, in other words, that's Hebrews 11.1. 1. In other words, believing in what you can't see is what faith is, right? So, by putting a nickel in, you're, you're going to be believing God to multiply that nickel for you some way, somehow. Especially if you can't afford to give even that nickel. We're believing that God will increase that so that you can put it back in and continue till you get to the place where now you have more than what you need. Amen? It's a faith project. You've got to start somewhere is where you've got to start. So when it comes to finances, the Lord gives us a tool, a way to better our finances. Don't ask me how and don't ask me why, but it works. I'm here to tell you, as a person who's been tithing my income for 24 years now, a tithe is 10%. Anything above the tithe is called an offering. God will move in your finances. I've seen him do some things in my finances that have just blown me away because I'm a tither. And he's been doing that for others here in this church as well, too. And he wants to do it for everybody. But you've got to learn those concepts. But even if you can't afford to put nothing in, God still loves you. He doesn't love you any less. All tithing is, is a way for him to help you in your finances. That's it. If you don't give, doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. Doesn't mean you're not going to be blessed. It's just a way for him to help you. It's a biblical principle that he's given us to help us. Amen? But we're talking about transformation and change. And the reason I'm using this as an example is because some people, when it comes to money, they got a death grip on it. They, two men couldn't release that from their hands. You got to kill them before you can get that out of their hands, right? You ain't taking my money, right? Some people look at money like that, right? Some people will die for it. Some people will kill for it. They'll steal for it. It's just money. When you start to understand that money is a tool that God has given us and it can be used to your benefit, then your way of thinking changes on money. You know, just like that word poverty. People who say, well, I'm poor. I'm, I'm poor. I can't afford to. Poverty is not about how much you have or how much you don't have. Poverty is a mindset. That's all poverty is. It's a way of thinking about yourself when it comes to finances. That's all poverty is. So you can have nothing, and if you understand that just because you have nothing don't mean that you have to have that mindset that God can still do some miraculous things inside of you in your life. See, that's good. But see, that mindset will keep people stuck. Poverty mentality. You don't want to have that mindset. But going back to the Apostle Paul, he had this transformation that took place in his life. When we've seen here in Acts 26, right, we see him telling King Agrippa, he's saying, this is what happened. I encountered Jesus, right? There was a bright light that shone, right? He was able to, you know, see himself on the inside because he was struggling. He discovered Jesus was alive, right? And here we see Paul talking about these things. He was kicking against the goads, right? Let's go to verse 16. And we know kicking against the goads is what? It's basically just struggling, right? Like he was. Verse 16, Acts 26, verse 16. 
So after Jesus told him in verse 15, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, verse 16, but rise and stand on your feet, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness of both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will reveal to you. So now he tells Paul, I've made you a minister and I've made you a witness. Right? All a minister is, is a servant. Somebody who serves others. So he told Paul, hey, I need you to go and serve others and be a witness. What is a witness? Right? A witness is somebody who can give an account of something, you know, right? We know about the court system. You guys watch, uh, what is that program, Law and Order? There it is, Law and Order, right? Oh, good program, right? They're always in the courtroom, right? They call in the witness, right, who's seen something happen. That's the witness. He tells his version of the story of what happened. That's what a witness is. So when Jesus tells Paul to be a witness, he's saying, Go and tell others about me. He's being a witness for the Lord. Right? So he's saying, I called you to be a minister. I've called you to be a witness. And this is what Paul goes and does. Right? And he takes this message to other areas, is what he does. That's his life's work. Everything that he was doing up until this point came to a halt when he realized things about himself and this encounter with the Lord Jesus and said, you know what? Jesus needs me to do this for him. And he raised his hand and he said, okay, sign me up. I'm with you. And he spent the rest of his life doing this work for Jesus. Everything that he was doing up until that point didn't matter. You see the, 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 the change that takes place? He was willing to put all everything aside that was priority in his life, all those things that he was focusing on, putting it to the side to say, you know what, I'll do it, Jesus. I'll go ahead and serve you. And this is what he ends up going to do. Isn't that awesome? Because why? Because he changed. See, awesome things happen when we really have these encounters with the Lord Jesus. Let me share, let me share with you uh, one more encounter. Let me share one. I think it's out of uh, chapter 15. Give me a second here. Because it's so key. It's very important. Is What happens is that we need to not ever let our relationship with the Lord get dry, get dull, let the fire go out, right? Amen. You know, where it becomes, uh, how would you say, same old, same old, right? We're, we're basically, um, uh, how would you say, we're just going through the motions, right? How many of you have ever gone to school or work and you're there but you're not there, right? You might be there physically but you're really not there, right? You're just going through the motions, right? You got yourself there but you're not in it, you're not even there, right? You're going through the motions, right? And so the thing is this, is that we don't ever want to let our relationship with God get to that place where it's dull, right? Where we're same old, same old, we're just going through the motions, right? I'm trying to find that scripture for you guys. I'll get there. So the thing is this, is that Paul was able to stay, you know, excited for the things of God through the rest of his life. How is that? And that came back to him spending time with the Lord, reflecting on what God did in his life. See, because there can be times in our life where we might not experience a miracle or a blessing for a long period of time, and then we start to do what? We start to question God. God, where are you in this? I, I haven't received anything lately. It's like going to the mailbox, you're waiting for that check to come, right? It's like, hey, mailman should be here any minute now. Mailman comes and you're like, it's not here. You're like, where is it? You're waiting, right? Paul knew this because if you study the life of Paul, God only spoke to him on two occasions, this time right here and another occasion, then that was it. 
So he only heard from God twice, but that was enough for him because he, he reflected on what God had did. Right? He reflected on what God did. If you guys know the story of Elijah and Elisha, the, the prophet Elijah, remember how you know, he passed on the mantle to him you know, to take over and be a prophet you know, for the Lord? You know, there was a 10-year waiting period between that happening. He had to wait 10 years for something to happen. How many remember when David was anointed king by the prophet Samuel when he was a young man? Remember he came to the house, his father's house, Jesse, right? And all the brothers, he said, hey, let me see all your sons. God had said, hey, go to that man's house. That's going to be the next king. I want you to anoint him. And so, all, you know, uh, David had a lot of brothers. And he was one of the youngest, so he had all these older brothers, grown men. And David was a young teenager at the time. And here they, you know, Jesse calls out his sons. And the prophet Samuel, one by one, goes down the line. No, nope, that's not him. No, no, no. And he's like, no. And they say, well, I got one more son, but he, he's out there feeding the dogs, tending to the sheep, rather. And his name was David. So he said, bring him to me. And they went and got him, brought him in. David was just this, this teenage boy. David seen him and said, or Samuel seen him and says, this is going to be the next king of Israel. But do you know that he didn't get a crown on his head at that very moment. You know, you see in the movies when they crown a king, right? They have this big old parade and ceremony, and they put the crown on his head, and it's a big old to-do. Well, just because Samuel said, hey, you're going to be the king, don't mean that it happened right there on the spot. How many of you know that David had to wait a number of years for this to happen? But just because he had to wait and he had to ex exercise some patience don't mean that that you know, plan that God had for him you know, wasn't going to happen. It's just, it was going to happen in God's time. Amen. See, so sometimes in our life, things don't go the way we want them to. We got to learn to wait on God, no matter how long it takes. See, some of us get impatient. There are so many stories of the Bible filled with people getting impatient. Because why? We don't want to wait on God. So what ends up happening is, we end up making some decisions because we don't want to be patient and then we've got to deal with those circumstances or consequences from those decisions because there's going to be consequences no matter what. Remember, anybody remember Abraham and Sarah when, when God had told them, you're going to have a baby? And Sarah laughed because she's like, man, I'm like 90 years old. What are you talking about? I'm going to have a baby. And then what happened? Time went on and nothing happened. She didn't get pregnant. So what did Sarah do? She says, you know what? I'll have Abraham, my husband, sleep with my handmaid and her servant, Hagar, and then she'll give him a baby, and maybe that's what God meant. No, that's not what God meant, but she did it anyways. And so Hagar has a son, Abraham ends up loving it, and then all of a sudden, Sarah gets pregnant miraculously. Ends up having a child close to 100 years old, having a baby. We know that that's unheard of, right? But we're talking about God here. And she has a son, he grows up, now what happens is what? the mothers of both those children are kind of butting heads because they want their son to be the favorite. Creating problems in the household. Right? And so now Abraham has to make a decision. What do I do? I got these ladies, you know, they're at my neck here. They're, you know, what do I do? So he had to make a decision and the decision he had to make was he had to send one of them away. Right? And he ended up sending Hagar and his son Ishmael away. That was a hard thing for him to do. But that was because of a decision they made not waiting on God. Right? These are the things that happen when we don't wait on God. We got to start learning how to wait on God. See, Paul learned how to wait on God. Even though God didn't always speak to him, two occasions throughout his life, God spoke to him, but he waited. Right? See, this is what happens, is when things don't happen in our time, we've got to learn to give it to God. We've got to learn to just wait on Him. It'll happen in His time, amen? Let's never get tired of waiting on God because we end up making decisions that aren't good for us. And then we have the consequences of that, amen? So getting back to Paul as we get ready to close. See, Paul was changed by that encounter because of what happened on the inside. He was forever changed. He was never the same. Became known as the Apostle Paul because of everything that he did. So remember, 
as we get ready to close this morning, God wants to continue a transformation in all of our lives. But the thing is this, before the change can happen, you have to believe it. See, if Paul didn't believe that Jesus was the one he was talking to, it would have never happened. You have to believe it first before it can happen. You have to believe it. Paul believed. So if you're facing anything in your life right now, no matter what it is, you first have to believe that it can change. And until you believe that it can change, it's not going to happen. Right? Now, once you believe that it can happen, now you've got to wait. Right? Don't get ahead of yourselves. Because if you get ahead of yourselves, then we end up trying to do God's job for him. Let's learn to wait on God. Let's learn to be a people that can exercise that patience. You ever heard the term, wait on the Lord? Oh, just wait on the Lord, brother. It's going to happen. It's true, it will. Wait on him. God knows what he's doing, amen? amen. So, we've got to believe it first. The transformation will happen. It will. I just want to encourage each and every one of you this morning to don't stop believing. Continue to believe in what he can do for you, amen? He can do something for you. This is just a small little something he did with a man named Saul. Became known as the Apostle Paul. Writes most of the New Testament. And here we are talking about his life story today. That's a witness right there. Now when he tells Paul that I'm going to make you a minister and a witness. Right? That's relevant for each and every one of us. God wants each and every one of us to be a servant. To do something for others. Right? And to tell others about him. That's relevant for every one of us, right? As a believer and as a Christian, do you know that God asks us to tell others about him? Not, this isn't the only place. You can go in the Gospels, and he says, take this message, this Gospel, to every tribe, tongue, and nation. It is our job to tell others about Jesus. The job of the believer, amen? That's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. Because why? Because many of you are struggling, even if you believe. Because if you're not convinced, how can you go and tell others? Right? If you're not convinced, that's why you have to be convinced. You have to believe. Like Paul, when he said, that's Jesus. Jesus was alive. Amen? We've got to be convinced. We've got to believe in order for that change to happen. For the sake of time, I'm not going to finish the rest of my notes, but I just want to encourage everyone this morning. Just to allow God to continue what he started in your lives. If I can have everyone just bow their heads and close their eyes. You know, we serve a good God. And he's not done with you. He says in his word, he who began a good work in you will complete it. He wants to finish what he started in your life. He wants to make you a better you than you are. See, you may be a great person today. You may be a, a presidential candidate. But still, God has worked to complete inside of you. We're all works in progress. None of us are, you know, reaching perfection. We're all works in progress. But see, we have to allow the Lord to continue that work He started in us to complete it. And if you allow Him to continue what He started in you, you will start to see changes. But you've got to believe that He can change you to be a better you. And he wants to. He wants to finish what he started. He wants to make you better than what you are today. But he can only do it if you allow him to. You've got to be convinced. You've got you to gotta believe that he can. You've got to let him do the work on the inside. God wants to do something in your life. More than what he's done already. I could sit here and tell you stories of the years of God doing things in my life. So many great things. Amazing things. And still he's not done with me. That's the God that we serve. Who's constantly doing things in our life. But we got to exercise patience sometimes. Even during those periods of time where nothing's going on. You may feel like, well, God ain't answering my prayers. You know, I prayed for, you know... 
a family member who was ill. They died. They didn't, they didn't get healed. God didn't hear me. God heard you. But see, sometimes we need to understand God has a plan. And it may not always match our plan. But it doesn't mean he didn't hear you. And it doesn't mean that he's not doing something. We got to come to a place to say, you know what, God? Let your will be done in my life. Even if I don't understand it, even if I don't agree with it, your will be done in my life. Because I know your plan for my life is better than anything I can think of. Amen? God is good. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning as we get ready to dismiss. Lord, I, I thank you for your people, Lord. Father, I pray, Father, that you would just continue to move in their lives and, and show yourself real to each and every one of them. Just like you did to the Apostle Paul, you showed him that you were alive. After going to the cross and after going to the pit of hell for three days, you showed Paul that you were alive. Lord, show your people Show your people. Reveal yourself to them just like you did to Paul. Speak to them. Show them, Lord. Oh, Father, I pray for a hunger and desire for everyone here to want more of you in their life, Lord. To want to be a minister and a witness for you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I thank you for your people. I speak blessings on them and I, I give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen, amen and amen. God.